was that on Thursday evening, the administrative board, uh, that's the leading committee inside of Sharptown Church, the overseeing body, if you will, of Sharptown Church, uh, met together and uh, had a chance to review January, February, and March. And let me just say to you, uh, with regards to some of the ideas uh, that were uh, shared at that time, having a chance to look at aspects of uh, our involvement at Sharptown, as well as uh, the giving, uh, thank you for your faithfulness, and thank you for your continued faithfulness. I think that evening our finance team reported that uh, the spending for Sharptown during January and February and March, the, compared to what was projected, was down 2%. Uh, which is always good, you like to hear that, and then uh, the giving was up 2%, and so I want to say thank you because uh, in the month of February, I think that there were probably three Sundays uh, that we had difficulty with weather, and uh, one Sunday completely we pivoted and, and called off the third service because of snow, and so nice job. I really want to say thank you for many of you who've made the transition as well from giving in person to giving online, and uh, that's been a wonderful addition and wonderfully helpful for us as a church family and thank you for your faithfulness as we continue to be in ministry uh, for the community as well as for the Sharptown Church and you can see that some of our program is continuing to be added back into our calendar and and we're so grateful for your your participation. I wanted to take a minute and to uh, just give you a thought out of Psalm 73 before we have a chance to pray. You do know that in the worship literature of the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, oftentimes the uh, writer uh, will do a comparative or a contrasting statement in order to make his point. Here in Psalm 73, that is true, a uh, contrasting statement. As you read through the psalm, uh, you come to the close as a summary statement, and here is the author makes this observation. As for me, as for me, it is good to draw near to God. As for me, it's good to draw near to God. I have found in God my refuge. I found in Him my refuge. And then he flips that. And he said, however, those who don't draw near to God, those who are far from God, they will perish. Today, as we have the opportunity to uh, look inside of God's word for our time together of, of examining scripture and, and our message time, we want to capture that concept, that idea about nearness and being far away and have the opportunity to think a bit more specifically about that. But today, as we gather together for prayer, we do so with the intention to draw near to God, to draw near to God. Uh, I'm uh, reminded that many of us carry a variety of concerns when we walk through the door on Sunday morning. And I want to invite you today, if your heart is heavy in some circumstance, if you're in a situation where you would like specific prayer and would like to just represent that before God, and you want to take a step of faith and just stand up and represent that before the Lord, I want to invite you, if you are carrying a concern this morning, I want to invite you to stand with me as we pray together. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, we take a, a pause, a deep breath, and to remind ourselves that we stand or we're seated inside of your presence. Perhaps for some, the morning has been filled with trying to get children here. It's been filled with schedule and just trying to get in the car and get here on time. And, and uh, we pause to reflect, to say thank you. We take a minute and recognize that we are not here by ourselves, but we are here gathered together in the fellowship of one another, but we are mindful of your presence here with us. We want to be people, like the psalmist said, that draw near to you. 
Lord, today, we're so grateful that as we look in your direction, that you remind us that you are a God who has the world in his hands, that you remind us that you still want to be, though, involved in our lives, and we want to confess to you that there are times when that idea and that concept of you constantly being with us is distant for us, and we can't seem to every single day be reminded that you're constantly involved inside of our lives, and sometimes we go hours, days, maybe weeks without recognizing you except for being here on Sunday. Help us, Lord. Help us, and we confess these areas inside of our life, these weaknesses, these areas of shortcoming, this sin, whether it's by commission of willful disobedience or by omission, Lord, we ask you to come and to meet us. Thank you that when we confess our sin, that you're faithful and just and forgive us our sin. And so this morning, we pray for many who would welcome and and readily receive a fresh and full forgiveness from you. We recognize that there are many needs this morning, some represented by individuals who are standing and some by people who are heavy-hearted, yet they remain in their seats, Lord. We're grateful today for you meeting us right where we are, and we commit these individuals who are standing and their friends or their family members to you. Thank you that you see past our exterior and you know the concern of our hearts collectively and as individuals. We pray, Lord, that you'll meet us. We want to turn these areas over to you, to trust you. Understanding, as we've already sung, that there's promises inside of Scripture. There's not a weapon that's formed against us that will prosper. We trust you. We ask that you'll help us, meet us. Thank you that we're not alone in the fight, that by faith we walk forward. We ask that you'll meet us in the remainder of our time together today as we open your word, speak to us. We invite you to challenge us once again. We invite your spirit to speak to us again. And we ask today that you'll meet us in our time together of worship. We offer the remaining time in our service to you, Lord, and and pray your blessing, your direction, your guidance in all that's said and done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So I want to begin this morning... with a very, very familiar passage of Scripture, one that many of you have committed already to memory. And I want to just draw out a line or a sentence inside of that section of Scripture and use that as a springboard to think about how it is that God meets us inside of the circumstances where we are. David writes in Psalm 23 about how God walks with us in all situations. And I'd like for you to read with me uh, this morning. In Psalm 23, or the shepherd's psalm, uh, David talks to us about uh, how it is in all situations and circumstances that God invites us into relationship. <clears throat> We're going to read together, and, and I want to tell you that there are times when we uh, put the uh, contemporary English version on the screen. Sometimes we'll read out of the New International Version. Occasionally we'll read out of some other ver- This is the King James version. Uh, Only because, you know, I've tried to read publicly the 23rd Psalm from another translation, and whatever happens in that situation, I always wind up putting an ETH at the end of things that don't have ETHs, and I say the these and the thous, and and, uh, this, uh, for some reason or another, there are other passages of Scripture that I have no problem with, but... uh, Really, at the sake of my own personal embarrassment, this is the King James Version this morning. And so I'd like to invite you to read with me, if you will, uh, this most familiar of all psalms, and then we want to...
capture a phrase uh, out of this psalm uh, that we've already had a chance to sing about uh, earlier today. So uh, read with me, if you will, please. Uh, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever." I trust that many of you could probably close your eyes and do that one more time without looking, but we're not going to go ahead and test you in that capacity. Let's go to the next slide. Here's the phrase that I'd like to pull out uh, this morning from our time together that's going to really be used as a springboard. Thou art with me. You're with me. You're with me. We've had a chance to sing about that already. We talked about the God of angel armies is always by my side. You are with me. I'd like to think with you a little bit more about that today and and consider uh, what the Bible has to say about that because I think that this concept is replete. It's on every page of Scripture nearly. We read through this and whether it's in relationship with individuals or whether it's in relationship with people groups, we have a God who wants to be with us. Now, the word we use for this is a, uh, is a word that you're also familiar with. Let's go to the next slide. This is a, an, an omni word. Uh, so there uh, are these words that describe the character of God, and this is one of them. Uh, the word is omnipresent. Uh, We have other omni words that we use from time to time that talk about the character of God. For instance, the word omnipotent, that God is all-powerful, omnipotent. Or that He is omniscient, that He is all-knowing. We have a God that is all-knowing. Omnipresent uh, means that, well, let's look at this definition if we could. Next slide, please. That God is everywhere all at once, at exactly the same time. That God is everywhere, all at once, at exactly the same time. We have a God who is constantly desires to be with you and with me. As a matter of fact, I think that this is the prevailing promise, says John Ortberg. Let's go one more slide if we could. He says that the most frequent promise in the Bible is not, I will forgive you. It is not, I will love you. The most frequent promise in the Bible is not these promises, however they're important. That the most frequent promise, whether demonstrated or whether articulated clearly, is the fact that I will be with you. Now, oftentimes, this is not so much described and detailed as it is acted out. And you have object lessons inside of the Old Testament and the New Testament as well that illustrate clearly that we have a God who is always present and who desires to be with you and with me. So... So far, not too much new information, I don't think. So far, I think we're pretty much on the same page. So far, I think that we've heard some of that information before. We try to wrap our head around that idea that God is everywhere all at once at the same time. And man, that sometimes just kind of stretches our mind a little bit and and stretches our thinking. And then that... Because he's all places, all at one time, all at the same time, he can be with us. And so far, we're good with that. However, let me take one step further with you, if I could, in our thinking. 
if God can be all places all at once, all at the same time, why would the Bible use words like this? He will be near you. Or draw near to him. Why would the Bible give us that indication if we have already the understanding that he can be with us all the time and so we kind of have this foregone conclusion yet he's omnipresent but yet the Bible does not stop and rest there. There's this spatial language, this spatial metaphor that he wants to be near. Near. And then for people who aren't God followers in the Old Testament, for people who aren't lovers of Yahweh, for other people groups, they're described as being far from God. How can that be if God is all places at all at once? They're far from God. They're near to God. It's an interesting sort of metaphor. In addition, there's this proximity metaphor about the idea that God wants to be close, near. And again, people who aren't followers of God, they're said to be distant or away from. I've been thinking a little bit about that, and, you know, these are some of the things that kind of... uh, Uh, they make my head hurt after a while, that yes, God is omnipresent, but yet the Bible uses spatial language, nearness, farness, proximity language, close or distant, in the midst of that understanding. Let me illustrate uh, one more time with an illustration I think that I've used here and you're very, very familiar with. A few years ago, Julie decided she was going to uh, surprise me for uh, an anniversary gift, and she uh, had saved her money, and and also uh, we got some discounted rates because we became chaperones. She signed me up to be a chaperone for a student trip that was educational in nature to Italy, and so... Uh, I chaperoned a a bunch of high school students and had a really good time doing that. But in addition to that, had a chance to spend some time and see some things that I otherwise probably would have never seen. And the thing that was remarkable for me, in addition to some of the food, uh, was the idea that uh, I was actually standing in the places where people that I had read about inside the Bible and followers of Jesus were buried. And the idea and the reality of the history of the New Testament just kind of, you know, kind of floods into that situation. One of the things that we did was, uh, as we went through the Vatican, had a chance to stand in the Sistine Chapel. Uh, You're not allowed to take pictures in the Sistine Chapel. Uh, Mrs. Smith found that out. Uh, And so uh, we were uh, in the Sistine Chapel and uh, we were having a chance to look up and to see this image, which you're very familiar with. Art historians and individuals who want to lay on top of not only art history, but also think about meaning, have a lot to say about this piece of artwork, a very small section then of the Sistine Chapel. The concept here in the Michelangelo's portrayal of the creation of man is the idea that God is the one who's the initiator. Look closely, if you will. God's represented by the bearded guy, and he's surrounded by angels, which has to do with speed, has to do with purpose, has to do with he's the one taking the initiative. The musculature, even, is the idea that God's arm is stretched out tightly. He's the one pursuing Adam. That God is the one who's reaching 
Notice the intentionality of his index finger. In contrast, notice the lackadaisical response, if you will, of, of, of Adam. Already created, lying back as kind of nonchalant, non-interested some. And then to Michelangelo's brilliant observation that there's this small gap that's between their index fingers that only with some intentionality does Adam reach in God's direction, but otherwise is free not to reach in God's direction, is free not to respond. Some would say that instead of this being the creation of Adam, this has more to do with the idea that God wants to be with creation. To be with creation. And specifically with Adam. That this is a relational understanding for Michelangelo. The idea that God wants to be with you is not something that is just occasionally mentioned in Scripture, but is virtually in every story, on every page, whether it's through individuals or with people, groups. So it begins inside of Genesis as God walks with His creation and stretches, He's the initiator, stretches in the in Adam and Eve's direction and comes in the cool of the evening every single day for intimacy, for fellowship, for relationship. He's the one who takes the initiative. He wants to be with his creation. He wants to be with you today. He wants to be with me today. That the Bible is not so much about us being with him or us pursuing him. But he wants to be with us. One of the ways that this is visualized in the Old Testament, if you're familiar with the history of the people of Israel, is that as they're wandering in the wilderness in, Le in Leviticus chapter, all the way up through chapter 9, is that God invites them to build a tabernacle because He wants to be in the center of the camp. Right in the center of everything that's going on. And so we get introduced to this idea of tabernacle, that God wants to be with the people in the center so that everything else that's going around the periphery is not as important as what's happening in the center. And then that people can come and be near God when they come into the tabernacle. Near God in the tabernacle. Close to God in the tabernacle. Some of the language around the tabernacle is really important. That when God's presence is there, the word inside the Bible is used, Shekinah. And it means this, the one who dwells. God's presence. He's there. He wants to be with people and invites them to be near Him. Now, that, that makes me scratch my head just a little bit. It makes me scratch my head because I know that God is always present all, all the time, all at the same time with people, but yet you have this spatial metaphor. He wants to be near. He wants to be close. And then there are even places in the Bible where people are, seem to be nearer to God than other places. Nearer to God than other places. Closer to God than other places. I don't know about you, but there are, are a couple places like that for me inside of my life. Where I could walk in, and because of past experience, or because of some profound movement of God, I feel like I'm nearer. Or closer. To like go camp. Asbury College. Taylor University. There are a couple of places at Asbury Theological Seminary. 
Nicholasville United Methodist Church. And there's a special spot across the street in the balcony. How is it that even though we know and we kind of say, you know, if you've been a believer for a while, oh yeah, he's omnipresent. But yet you have this spatial metaphor, this proximity metaphor, closer, nearer. So in the Old Testament, he wants to be close, right in the center. He wants to tabernacle. By the time you get to the New Testament, this understanding uh, takes on not only a different meaning, but a deeper meaning and a fuller meaning in the person of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 1, When the angel comes and talks to Mary, talks to Joseph, the angel says, oh listen, by the way, I want you to name that baby Emmanuel because, because I'm omnipresent, but when he comes in the flesh, you'll recognize him, he's Emmanuel, God with us, God with us. John's gospel says it this way, and we thought about this recently. The language in chapter 1 of John's gospel says, And the Word became flesh and pitched His tent, tabernacled right in our front yard. Now, listen, God goes from being omnipresent to being right here, right here, with us. It doesn't stop there. How close does he want to be? How near does he want to be? How close does he want you to be? How near does he want you to be? As Jesus is making preparation to go to the cross, he gathers the disciples and In the 14th chapter of John, the second person of the divine trinity, Jesus, talks to us about the third person of the trinity, but the language, the proximity, the spatial metaphors collide inside of his description. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you Someone exactly like me. That's what that word means. Another advocate. Exactly like me. I'm going to send to you another who's exactly like me. Listen. They were thinking, I, I don't know. I'm already trying to work my head around the idea that God has a son. And now... Jesus is saying, I'm sending you another exactly like me. And then he goes on to say, and by the way, he's not going to be with you just for three years. He's going to be with you. Notice, with you. The spatial metaphor, the proximity metaphor, with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world can't accept him because it doesn't see him, doesn't know him. Now, pay close attention. This is an absolute game changer. Here, the proximity metaphor, the spatial metaphor collide. But you know him. He lives with, we know that already. He's with us. He's omnipresent. He's with us. No, no. He's going to be in you. It's completely different. How near does he want to be? He wants to be in you. He wants to be with you. Constantly abiding. The hymn writers of yesteryear grabbed hold of this concept, I think that maybe this is the first time 
I heard about this whole idea about God wanting to be near or close. Let's go to the next slide if we could. Nearer, my God, to thee. Nearer to thee. Even though it be a cross that raiseth me, still all my song shall be. Nearer, my God, to thee. Nearer, my God, to thee. Near. This is not just the song that they sing on the Titanic when things look bleak and everything is going down. No, no. This is a reality inside of Scripture about proximity, about spatial metaphors, that God himself wants to be near, and he wants you to be near. Another hymn. Next. I'm thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice. It's told thy love to me. I long to rise in arms of faith. Be closer. Draw me nearer. Omnipresent? Yes. There's nowhere you're going to go this week that you're not in the presence of the living God. Nowhere. That doesn't mean you always recognize him, does it? (laughs) Oh, that we would practice his presence more. How near does he want to be? With you? Oh, yes. But in you. Constantly abiding. Nearer. 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 I've often wondered then, thinking about this reminder that Jesus has given to us. If the idea has something to do with John chapter 14. Now, stay with me here. The upper room event takes place after John 14, and I will be in you. Not just with you, but in you. And yet Jesus gives us a meal which is remarkable in the reminder itself because you ingest this. It becomes in you. And I wonder then if the body and the blood of Christ that we are invited to share has a much more profound meaning than just a memorial meal but is a constant reminder that he wants to be in you consistently. I want to invite you to grab your communion elements, if you will. Peel back that first layer of cellophane and, uh, and hold on to that little wafer. Every time we take hold of, whether it's a piece of bread, or in this case, uh, this small wafer, we say these words that this is my body. Let's just say it this way. This is the incarnation. God with us. My body, broken for you. Take and eat it. Kind of peel back that aluminum foil. Someone said to me this morning, well, Smith... Kind of brave of you wearing that shirt. You're going to wind up with communion all over you. Thought, 
thought never crossed my mind until I got here and someone pointed that out to me. It's likely to happen. Jesus said, not only are you mindful of my body, but please recognize that I want to close the distance. I want to be near you. It's funny how sometimes we use this language that sin creates distance. That people who aren't walking with God are far away from Him. That the spatial and the proximity metaphors, when we talk about people who don't know Christ, always have to do with distance. But yet He said this, If you allow me, if you allow me, I'll remove your sin, your distance. I'll remove it from you so we can be near and I can do something about your sin, which is an obstacle as far as the east is from the west. So he shed his blood for your forgiveness so we could be near, take and drink it. He's always present, all at once, all at the same time. Yes, that's true. But yet he invites us to be near, to be close. I think that that has everything to do with the disposition of your heart and the disposition of your intention and your response. You know, it gets more fascinating to me when you connect some of these concepts that it was the brother of Jesus, the brother of Jesus, who wasn't a follower of Jesus all the time, who doubted who he was, who really wondered who in the world he was related to. It's the brother of Jesus who said this, if you come near to him, he'll come near to you. If you come near to him, he'll come near to you. And not only that, he makes provision that we come near and that we can live near. We can live close. This last song reminds us that this Holy Spirit, this Comforter, this Paraclete, this one who is given, who is exactly like Jesus, to live in us, gives us the ability and the power we need to live lives that are pleasing to him. And that's where we're going to think about over the month of May. But remain seated, if you will. Lift up your voices. This is a wonderful way to close our service today because the one who is in you is greater than he that's in the world. Dancing. 
sing of our great and matchless King. Seated high on the throne, you shall reign forevermore. You shall reign with me. <clears throat> is he always present? Yes. But isn't it interesting that even when we describe our own walk with God, sometimes we use language like, I feel far from him. I feel distant. I feel as though God is far from me. He's just not near. I want to invite you today that he invites us into not only his presence, but also into a nearer relationship. It makes little difference where you were in proximity or spatially using those metaphors when you came in. The thing is, as we close today, you could be near. You could be close. Draw near. Come close, said James, the brother of Jesus, and he'll draw near. He'll come close to you. You pray with me. Lord, we want to thank you today for the reminder that you are a God who has pitched your tent in our front yard. You're a God who wants to be not only with us, 
but in us. For many of us, Lord, this morning, we've already invited you to be near, to be close. We've invited you to be with us in all situations and circumstances, but today we recognize there still may be those in our our worship time where we've not extended that invitation. And Lord, we know that we can live in a different relationship to you than we did when we came in, perhaps, merely by asking, merely by inviting you to come in and come near. We pray, Lord, that you'll go with us today. Not only go with us, but remind us that we can live in your presence and practice living in your presence every hour of every day this week. So help us to that end, we ask in Jesus' name. We want to be near. We want to be close. And we don't want there to be any barrier or distance. So we pray, Lord, that you'll go with us. We might be mindful of your presence in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you.